Yeah, they're, they're missing quite a lot, right? I mean, that, that term Dark Ages, is, it fits into many of the things we just talked about right before in terms of it's a, it's a sensational, you know, kind of emotive term to use, right? And, and it, uh, it fits with a lot of, you know, Hollywood presentations of any, any movie set in the medieval period, you know, is, is usually right, dark. There's dark lighting. There's dark costuming. It's always muddy. Um, it's always raining. I mean, a lot of these movies take place in England. So, you know, sure, maybe it rains, you know, rains a lot there, but okay. But, you know, mud and uh, violence and blood everywhere and people were uncouth and you know, everybody's walking around with a turkey leg like at the Renaissance Fair and what have you. And uh, um, with that, you know, bad, bad table manners and this and that. So it's, so there's this, you know, emotive, evocative, you know, image of what life was like back then. Um, and we miss substantial amounts of things about that period. Right. I mean, you know, we, we forget that the middle ages were a period of time or, you know, even the so-called dark ages and there's debate, you know, within the academic community as to how you, how you, how we date things and how we classify things as time periods. Right. Um, so, you know, and no, no historian today of any metal is going to use the term dark ages, right. It's still used in a populist setting, but not, not at all in the academic setting anymore. So, um, which kind of falls back to what I was talking about earlier, how you see a lot of these things in the academic world now that have, have moved forward. Um, but, hasn't really the popular area hasn't caught up to it yet but so we're missing things like you know um parliamentary democracy right is it is a creation of the middle ages uh university system is a creation of the medieval period right uh, massive amounts of, of growth in architecture um and different styles of architecture and art um and i would even go so far as to those are kind of the more obvious ones but one one area i think that, that really we do miss in an understanding of this period is an understanding of the relationship between church and state, especially in, in the Western part of the world, right? So with the fall or the collapse of, you know, governing authority from Rome at the end of the fifth century through the middle legal, medieval period, you know, you have the kings and dukes and, you know, all this power revolving down onto local ethnic at the time, Germanic chieftains. And then over time, you see the development of, of these European kingdoms and then eventually much, much later, right, uh, nation states and what have you. But in the West, because I think of that, that that collapse of central governing authority in Rome in the fifth century and the, um, you know, the rise of the church in terms of bishops and the role of bishops in urban areas and in those previously administrative regions of the Roman Empire, especially the Bishop of Rome, um, you know, you see a, a struggle in many ways between church and state, right? A tension. I mean, sometimes that's a healthy tension, I like to describe it, and other times it's a more um, full of, you know, violent tension between between the two spheres, if you will, between the secular and spiritual sphere. But that's, you know, and that's, and, you know, when we think of the Middle Ages or we think of the Dark Ages, people hear that term, they think of, you know, church and state locked together and, and the church dictating what the state does and telling what the state to do and, uh, we think, oh, we're so enlightened in our modern era because we have that separation, if you will, right, between church and state. Uh, and so the church doesn't tell, religious figures don't tell secular figures what to do. Um, but we we miss the fact that that was never the case in the Middle Ages, in the medieval period, and in, in the so-called Dark Ages, that there was this great tension. And it's a uniquely, I think, at least in terms of the history of the church, um, a West, you know, uniquely Western uh, relationship and uh, and you know outgrowth of that geopolitical situation at the time, so I think that's something that comes out of these ages that we don't we don't recognize and focus on as much, um, but I think we should. Yeah, you know that's really interesting because it's an example of really turning maybe some of the myths on its head. Because you know in the outline I gave, uh, it was kind of just like a broad idea of these were bad kind of backwards times, but to really the point of our conversation. People don't just think that these are bad backwards times, but they seem to lay some of that blame on the church itself. And by talking about the relationship between church and state here, I think you're showing that you know it might actually be opposite uh, of what some people are thinking here of the the church's role in all this. But you know maybe for those who are blissfully ignorant uh, of the myths that are going on here, it might be worth just saying for a minute what kind of like fault is laid at the feet of the church for this time period? Like what are some of the specifically Catholic myths about the dark ages? Um, so in terms of what people think about the church during that period of time, like things. Yeah, that the church I, th yeah, yeah so. I think so. And of course we can correct those. Um, but I realized that in, in my initial outline, I might not have given what, what's some of the myths about the church that people are coming to, uh, to this time period with. 
Yeah, so I think, I mean, one I mentioned, you know, just, just a minute ago in terms of the church controlled, you know, society, the you know, you churchmen who told secular rulers what to do, kings and dukes and whatnot. Um, you know, there is this kind of general, uh, I think, pervasive myth in many cases about this time period where the church was this omniscient, omnipotent, autocratic institution, you know, and it was the same in every area of, you know, the Western world. And that's not true, right? The relationship between church and secular rulers varied, depending on what area of Christendom in Western Europe you're talking about. Um, you know, there's there's certain myths, you know, that, for example, you know, that the church, um, you know, chained Bibles, for, you know, uh, in cathedrals or churches because they didn't want people to read, right? Or they want to repeat, they want to they have access, people have access to the scripture. Um, that's a prevalent one, right, that's, that's still heard. Um, you know, the church was concerned about making sure that everybody, you know, believes the same way. And that there's a certain amount of truth to that. So we, I know we're going to talk about that in a minute, but... Um, you know, and so because of that, it went out and arrested people for believing differently and uh, tortured people and, and even killed people, you know, by the tens of thousands or even millions by some account, depending on you know, different, different sources you read. Um, you know, so there's there's that general sense of or even in, I'm sure we'll get into this topic, too, that, you know, the church was concerned about all the infighting that was going on among second, third and fourth born sons in Europe who couldn't inherit the land of their families. And so to get them to stop fighting in Europe uh, and causing havoc, they decided to call the Crusades and send everybody off to, to fight the Muslims in North Africa and the Holy Land. Um, and so again, elements of certain elements of truth to some of these things, but you know, um, in very much in large part, completely historically inaccurate. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this clip. If you did, you'll probably enjoy the full interview too, which you can find here. And if you haven't already, you should consider subscribing, which you can do here. Lastly, if you are bought into the vision of gospel simplicity, which is bringing simplicity out of theological and historical complexity, you can support the channel by going to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity or clicking on the link in the description down below. Thanks and God bless.